So um, next up, we have uh, Katie Wang. And Katie is going to be joining us and is a data governance enthusiast as well as a business enabler. Been in many different privacy roles, such as legal compliance, DPO, etc., and recently landed as a privacy leader at Inter IKEA, responsible for guiding, overseeing, and implementing comprehensive privacy controls across the company. Control has obviously been something that we've been discussing a lot restrictions, policies, auditings, permissions, content sensitivity locations, access history is also something that's new that's coming up. What is the sensitive data, how we collect it, how we use it, and of course, the protection thereof, the storage, the locations, what, why, and when. So Katie's going to be joining us to hopefully teach us about more uh, information about the privacy roles and the compliance thereof. So Katie Huang, I hope, will be joining us now. Uh, I just want to double confirm, Eloid, I need to join from a separate link, or I can direct use this link. Uh, you can use this one that we're here, I believe. I think you should have control. Um, yeah, I can share my screen, actually. There you go. Please go ahead. Okay. Hi, Katie. How are you? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, let me check. Sure. So, Katie, while you're sharing inter IKEA, what does the inter mean? So uh, the, it could be a misunderstanding. So I I I, I want to like just shortly clarify. Um, Thank you. We, you guys see the presenter mood or the presentation, right? Yes, data privacy with global retailer. Inter okay, Inter perfect, perfect, perfect. So uh, in uh, in 20, uh, 2016, there was a separation, or we called in IKEA way. It's funny. We called it divorce. Um, between Inter IKEA and Inga. So we used to be a same group company called uh, IKEA, and then we separate for many different purposes. Tax is one of them, but uh, most of them we want to provide a better uh, customer journey or customer experience. And that's why we separate the logistic part. And uh, logistic, I'm talking about the whole logistic, including all the admin things, part to Inter and Inga as a, a franchiser part of the group. So and do you where, share the data between the two companies? That's a very good question. <laughs> yes, and we are even, uh, uh, there is an ongoing initiative between these two groups that we want to set up a so-called uh, tech foundation, which including like uh, how we uh, best secure data sharing and uh, from privacy standpoint, the transparency towards the end customer, for example. Uh, but most of them is just like uh, the high level agreement and how we use uh, a consistent approach to make sure uh, those data are shared in a compliant way. And apart from that, uh, a lot of uh, legacy uh, systems and solutions that are actually from Inter IKEA is hosting by uh, Inga and due to the, you know, the slowly separation. So. Very right. interesting. I'm waiting with bated breath. I'll leave the leave it up to you, Katie. Please go into presenter mode and tell us all about it. Thank you. Thank you a lot. I see, like you, uh, you already get a little bit the introduction about me, and just a, a bit of side note. Um, I what I figure out during my long data privacy journey since like already ten years until now, and I, I'm I have a background as a lawyer and uh, focus on IT law. Uh, at the moment. Uh, what I discovered in my uh, data privacy journey and adventure, I, I found out two things, like uh, un 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 unrevealed, uh, maybe a secret, so to say like this. Every company, or oh, never, I've never hear uh, that one company said, we are 100% privacy or GDPR compliant, for example. And the second thing is, data breach is, is always the, 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 the master or the, the what to say that to, to drive those uh, data privacy practitioners to awake in the middle of night. These two uh, um, a revealed reality that, that, that I discovered, I want to share with you. All right, uh, come to the journey that how in the IKEA like uh, uh, protect uh, or data privacy governance and strategy with uh, Inter IKEA as a, a global retailer company. I will 
I, I have a really simple slide today uh, with uh, two main topics. The first one is about big retailer and the data system. The second one is about like how we as a, a IKEA, as an example, we our data governance and strategy to fulfill uh, the uh, requirement, how we governing the uh, data systems. So, um, Speaking about like a, a big retailer's data system, then the, mo the most important thing for us is about the data ha handling, the data management, so to say. So data management technology or data management allows us as a retailer company to utilize the data or let's say customer data, inventory data, transaction data. And customer data, I would like to extend I, uh, that uh, in the next slides, I will explain more, but I would like to extend these two personal data if you think about like this way, because it's not only about customer data, it's also about um, business partner. It's also about coworker that we need to see it as a whole. And then with such data, you could have a lot of uh, uh, different user experience, of course, but what we focus on, think about like every company is doing the same, the like digitalization journey and to make the more cost-efficient uh, data-driven uh, uh, decisions to improve the user experience or so to say overall user-friendly environment. One big example, of what we are doing now with IKEA from a business operations standpoint, we have a project so-called uh, operation, uh, finance and platform, OFP, operation, finance and platform. What we want to achieve is to link uh, the, the whole uh, supply chain or until the end user the, to the customer to make this digitalization flow just direct connect to each other. From what I'm telling, you could like lose uh, cyber colleague or information security colleague. You could already feel exciting because mm -hmm. there are so many different aspects we need to consider okay. uh, when it comes to. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but your slides are not moving. Yes, um, the first one. Sorry, I'll just put that person on mute. Sorry, Marlon. Uh, excuse me? So the slide is not moving, right? No, no. Yeah, we are seeing just the first one. Uh, we, we see your screen in edit mode of the PowerPoint, not the presentation mode. So yeah. maybe you have the wrong window selected for sharing. Uh, uh, Swip. How about this? Uh, yes, that looks better. I see a uh, beautiful <laughs> IKEA desk thingy. <laughs> I wish someone told me uh, earlier. <laughs> now it's a little bit awkward. Okay. <laughs> Just to make sure you guys are awake because it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, okay. But you guys see the slides like up to date. Now I'm in data management. Yes, data management, the retail sector, you're correct. Okay. Perfect. Okay, then I just explained like we have this uh, project called OFP, Order, Operation, Finance, and Platform, where we want to connect direct the user order uh, towards the at the end uh, from supplier's end. From this journey, you could see already from data collection, data utilization, data storage, data analysis, the whole data life cycle will pose a lot of different concerns from compliance standpoint or from even from data privacy standpoint. Okay, speaking about this, these are like some examples like in in, in, our, in our sector that you could think about like, or, or people could generally think about like a, a customer data or consumer data, but what specifically we consider in the retailer company. We have, for example, big data analy analytic. We, you could think about like a warehousing, Process. I could make a, I could make a, an example like in our warehouse system. Um, I I one time I have the I had the privilege um to visit like an Amazon their warehouse. They have of, of course like a, a digitalization uh, the patching or reorganizing or even like a carton or packing. But I I would say like we are a little bit uh, epic due to the uh, complex complexity of our uh, operation landscape, we are slowly moving toward that direction. And from that standpoint, you could think about what can be improved in, for example, a workspace efficiency. There are like recently we have some project, uh, we, we, called it, we called it a project ego. And then we analyze the data that attach from the forklift 
as a, uh, a, a, a as, as an example to see how people uh, pack or deliver those um, let's say the big products like packing in a big package or carton and also to detect how the best way when we deliver it to not to destroy the carton or to not destroy the inside products to reduce the defeat rate. And that's one of the typical example. It's really amazing if you have a chance to visit that. And apart from that, they also attach different like AI uh, functions or features to low system, of course. And I would say, in that specific case where I just explained, you think about the camera attached to the forklift, then you can also image like, oh, this lost camera could film human, like car workers, eh, or those people work, eh, even the business partner in the warehouse area. How we deal with that? That is what where privacy sit in. And of course, there is the answer. We use like a blur function to make sure those by default uh, from the cloud, those uh, data are just blurring. You cannot identify any person. But this is just like uh, one of the example I want to bring up to see personal data in the retailer uh, area. And then uh, optimizing the omni-channel strategy. Of course, what you define from privacy standpoint, it must feel fulfill the uh, business operation. And of course, their priority. And then process process flow and the uh, automation. This I just make some small example that's probably easy to understand. And from this journey, then you think about like what is really in depth about data privacy, like what I mentioned the two like two slides ago. It's about personal data, but it's not only customer personal data. It's about business partner, coworker, and customer personal data. So. We need to consider all the aspects when we are defining our, like, so to say, privacy by design. Uh, from here, I would like to migrate to the next topic, uh, data privacy and governance and strategy within uh, our company as an example. So uh, where we start from? I think uh, people could think about if you are talking about strategy, OK, then we, might, we must define certain strategy for your, our uh, business strategy. But what, where we start from? We start from to have a long-term or more sustainable idea. It's called a vision. We have a data privacy vision. Our vision is to have a trust and protected brand. In order to achieve that, then we can um, we can add like a, so to say like sub subtask those vision in a more like actionable way. So it's a, it's about like enable trust and loyalty and transparency to, to protect customer, coworker, and IKEA brand, business partners data. It's about to um, to avoid a personal data breach and related incident. It's also about handling personal data in a compliant way, locally and internationally. And it's about set a clear rule of uh, personal uh, data across IKEA value chain within the code of conduct. So, so to say, uh, from this point, you could think about this code of conduct, and then you might have question: Is this a global approach? Not really, because if you refer to the second point, handling uh, data personal data compliance, local and international, then you could already think about like uh, IKEA as a global wide coverage. We need to have an approach that allows us to uh, com uh, compliant or be applicable to comply with all applicable law uh, from a more centralized level and to a more local level. From that, this is uh, uh, how we deal with laws that impact the laws and regulations. So in IKEA, we decide to take uh, EU GDPR as a, minimum, as a minimum standard for all the personal data handling. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's uh, applicable or not applicable. However, if local law, let's say, it prevails the, a certain requirement, like retention period, let's say, they have shorter retention period, then in this case, we, we adapt a so-called hybrid approach that allow local have their discrepancy. But of course, there must be a, 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 a legal justification behind. And I believe this is a lot of international company take the same approach. Not necessarily GDPR to be if you are China Chinese based company, then the the Chinese uh, personal data protection law. But then this approach allows us to set up a global minimum or let's say a baseline 
for all the personal data handling. But of course, they are at more detail on like uh, Glima and dependency. Sometimes uh, people feel like uh, uh, the version of our privacy policy need to be changed or adapt a lot. And how or who can verify if those uh, changes are both applicable to a bilateral business relationship, like we need to govern from EU, we also need to govern from, for example, uh, India privacy law in a bilateral way. It's always a hard balance. All right, and start from the vision, then we come to and those actionable sections. Then we come to the second point, the governance framework. So here in, uh, in the IKEA, we use a so-called uh, privacy pyramid, start from the processing inventory, which is uh, very well known, you can think about GDPR, it's called ROPA. And then in the second layer, you have the DPIA, risk management, privacy by design, which is more operation level, uh, how you make sure like a uh, uh, personal data is being evaluated in a, the whole life cycle. And then another layer is of course the communication training awareness, I've seen I've see a lot of the different cases, like people complain, we don't have business buy-in, we don't have the, um, how to say, uh, enough uh, local or so-called prolonged arms and legs for data privacy team. Um, this, is, this must be an uh, action or an act and activity parallelly being considered while you are doing different layer of activity. And then we think about this uh, data transfer, data management and private policy and procedures, more like ways of working and also touch base on a wider group, how, you, how we uh, cater this uh, international transfer. And then it's the organization and accountability. At the end, it's aggregated to the strategy where we want to uh, achieve. So um, it, with, with, with this, and then if you think about, okay, now we have the vision and we have the governance framework, how is the ways of working here in anti care we have a, something so-called a cycle. This cycle is actually not only for data privacy. We all use this as a ways of working, but it's just I we as I especially uh, put on so people understand how we category different area. We have a so-called process people technology and data circle, and it's always start with the process and the people and the technology so that you can make sure like when we define a certain procedure or a certain initiative. It's recyclable. And let's say what are we referring and what we are doing now at the moment, referring to this um, a, a cycle, four main area. Uh, one area is about the draw on the um, build, it, build on existing uh, data privacy organization. People could think, uh, why is this even like a focus? No, this is actually a living goal. You need to think about like this. Why? Um, this year, we have the Data Act. We have the Data Governance Act. We have the EU AI Act. Do you believe like your existing competence is sufficient to govern what you want to achieve in the privacy area? That's it. It, it is always like a living goal, I would say like that. And that's why uh, for us, it's important always review, like uh, for example, uh, an annual basis, if the team is... Um, is, is, if, if the team now is still like enough, we have enough resource, people, knowledge, and together with the, uh, another circle, I will explain later. And the second one is building, uh, building up a compliance capability. Okay, this is uh, not only an action. Sorry, there is something pumps out um, in the screen. I hope that's not disrupt you. All right. And Building up the comp uh, compliance capability. This is not, not only about like, uh, okay, uh, if people we hired is actually fit the, the DP organization rule, uh, the so-called DPSME. No, it's about like uh, how you assess the maturity level of all the landscape. Yeah, you, know, you could do it per legal entity. You could do it per region, for example. It depends on your company setup, but then, with that as an, as, as an outcome, then you, you could identify high risk and low risk area, you could identify gaps. And with that gaps, then you need to design and define like the local com uh, compliance comp capability, not only for uh, data privacy or practitioners or data privacy leaders, where we call it here, 
but also for legal resource, but also for compliance resource, and even like a different area of expertise. That is how can we build up a more health uh, comp compliance uh, capability. And then the next one is uh, to embed the data privacy organization controls. And it, th this is probably more easy to understand. You could think about like privacy by design, but in IKEA, we have something called uh, so-called uh, data privacy assessment. And it's set from all the project, you could target project, you could target initiative, digital solutions. And this is always, again, a living controls because you know the state of art could change from time to time. And then the next one is about cons uh, constant regular regulatory monitoring. This uh, address the post-pack data privacy risk and managing instant, for example. Uh, you need to keep the lights on, reduce the destruction on our business operation by foresee like future risk, what could happen. I mean, I would say this year with the AI topic, it's really different because um, I've never seen like a, a so rush, um, let's say decision making on how we do, what we can do, or how can we re uh, restrict user to do, or even if you can even ban user from using it. And But then, this, this topic is more important now when it comes to uh, interact with the whole circle. When you're planning the resource, when you're building up the compliance capability, and when you embed the different technical controls required by data privacy or even more wider uh, legal landscape. So with that, uh, this will be at the end of my presentation. Thank you, Katie. Now, there's a lot of questions because obviously IKEA is a global, extremely well-known brand that, as you said, has had some kind of uh, separation, segregation, sharing of information, of course, um, storing of that information. But privacy is obviously where you've been focusing on. How would a department set up the process and flow automation and how would they use technology to enable that? You mean a department or like any business units, right? Well, I think with the size of IKEA, you probably have an IT department, um, but you'd also have to have a compliance department and a legal department. But again, when we've talked to different um, speakers of today, some companies aren't large size enterprises like IKEA. They may be small, medium sized businesses rather instead. And if they are, how would they look to begin to set up a process or a flow of automation of uh, securing their IT, for instance? Yeah, Do you think again, that I... they need to get a consultant? Uh, would they need to hire somebody to do that? Um, where Where would you start, Katie? Well, I I think uh, our approach really, our approach impact me a lot. Uh, start from um, in, in a traditional, like let's say like a small SME, you could think about, okay, what issue they have, what gaps they have with the internal audit. And then you try to implement some strategy or some uh, framework that suit this company. But like here, as a like a global a global company, we are thinking about the sustain sustainability, and that's why we don't start from identify gaps. We start from set up the vision or set up a a level of strategy that is sustainable to for a long term perspective. And with that, bear in mind, and also with that, uh, to break down in different area of control and sections, then we start to put in what we want to achieve as, uh, for example, digital solutions. And then together, uh, at the, on one hand side, with the privacy control and visions, on the other hand side, there are technical and organizational measures referring to these visions, of course, and where you, you could attach easily to different like standards, industry standards, but it doesn't matter. You just need to have a systematic way to work on it. Like you for us, we, yeah, we use- You talked about a code of conduct. Um, and the yeah. GDPR standards and the local yes. law. So yes. do small, medium and large size enterprises need to look into every single local level law before looking into moving into business in that area? Is that a, a suggestion that you are willing to 
Right no, here? I, what, I, would, I would not say that because according to my experience, it will be a lot, a huge effort behind. Yeah. Usually what you do is that to adapt the most restrict uh, legislations. And that oh. is already, yeah, you compare all the legislation on table and then mm -hmm. adapt the most restrict one, then you already cover everything. I see. But for the common practice, for the common practice, it must be more like a workable. Uh, what I say workable is like, of, of, or let's say like a GDPR, you have six different legal bases, but in mm -hmm. Chinese law, you maybe have only five. And what, 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 what we do with those one as in, in gaps, like uh, they don't have legitimate interest in. And how can you do with a global solution that both used in you and China? Yeah. And that, that's what I say. You need to uh, adapt a workable one uh, according to your company's capability. And the last question that we have, which we've also had with the previous panelists is, how often do we do this? How often should we update our policies? Who should be responsible for that? And what is the best method and practice to monitor it? Yeah, uh, this is a very good question because uh, I see many companies like uh, they are struggling on the frequency of, of updating, especially this year. Like so many different policies, some, some suddenly come to in place because those new regulations. But again, you need to have a sustainable approach, a recyclable approach. So I would say, in our company, for example, we annual will be a very like reasonable, mm -hmm. uh, recyclable time frame. But if you are small SMB, then you could consider even biannually. With the uh, precondition is you need to have a, a systematic monitoring of new legislations. Or well, maybe setting up AI for alerts itself. Yeah. If there's any particular <laughs> legislation changes, a, send me a message. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's a very good point. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very, very, very much for your time today, Katie. Oh, thank um, you.